Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Philip Ely and on behalf of the Children, Youth and Families at Risk Professional Development and Technical Assistance Center, thank you for joining our webinar. We're pleased uh, today to have Dr. Carl Olson and Adriana Napolitano as our presenters today. But before we begin, there are a few administrative announcements. A recording of today's webinar will be posted on the CIFAR PDTA Center's website at CIFAR.org. We ask that uh, during the presentation that you can discuss any uh, at any time using the chat feature. But if you have a specific question for our presenters, we ask that you use the Q&A feature as depicted on your screen. At the, the conclusion of uh, this webinar, you'll see a pop-up window. And as for our, our survey, we value your feedback and we ask that you would complete this very short survey to discuss today's webinar and also any uh, future potential topics. And now it is my pleasure to present our guest from the Penn State Athletics Department's Performance Psychology Services. Carl is the Assistant Athletic Director for Performance Psychology Services at Penn State. Prior, he served in the US Army, serving as Associate Professor and Director for the Center of Enhanced Performance at the United States Military Academy, West Point. Carl serves as an advisor to several think tanks and committees pursuing strate strategies for leveraging mental health strength and enhanced performance. He holds a membership in the Association for Applied Sports Psychology and is a certified mental performance consultant, as well as he currently serves on the education committee within the Big Ten Mental Health and Wellness Cabinet. Carl holds a bachelor's degree from the United States Military Academy, a master's degree from the University of Virginia, another master's degree from the United States Air Forces, Air University, and a doctorate degree from Penn State University. He has been published in the Journal of Sport Behavior, the Journal of Instructional Psychology, Military Medicine, and Military Psychology. And joining him today is Adriana, who is the Director of Performance Psychology Services at Penn State. She was a Master Resilience Trainer, Performance Enhancement at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where she worked with Army soldiers on coaching and developing mental performance, as well as resilience skills. Adriana holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Scranton. She has a master's degree in athletic counseling from Springfield College, where she coached and worked with collegiate teams as a mental skills consultant in the Northeast area. During her time at Spring Hill, Springfield. Adriana also interned at the Center for Enhanced Performance at the United States Military Academy, West Point. Adriana holds a membership in the Association for Applied Sports Psychology and is a certified mental performance consultant. She also is certified to teach and train mindful sports performance enhancement. So without further ado, Carl and uh, Adriana, the floor is yours. All right. So as Philip said, uh, we are the two-person performance psychology department at Penn State, and while we're in an athletic department, one of the thing, one of the reasons we use the term performance psychology instead of sports psychology is we believe that everything that we teach is applicable to every walk of life. A anything that is a performance that matters, you can use some of the strategies that we're going to share today. So when we talk about performance psychology, it's not just for sport, it's performance psychology for life. Now, how does that fit with all kind of other uh, high stakes activities? Well, we look at things like um, if you're involved in something that really matters, the stakes are high, it's really important to you. In those moments, there's all, there's all other forces. There's the, the opponent gets a vote, the enemy gets a vote, the conditions get a vote. And in those situations, you got to be really good at dominating the controllables. So, so much of this is about self-awareness and self-regulation. Now, when we're talking with our teams, a lot of times we'll use the phrase, if you slow things down, the game is going to teach you things. And that game can actually be the game of life. Life is going to teach you things if you are open and if you are composed and ready to receive the lessons. So when we talk about leveraging lived experiences, it's, that's a lot of what we're talking about. We're talking about let life teach you some things like we've all been on a journey we've all hit challenges some adversity figured some stuff out sometimes we haven't don't realize we figured some stuff out but we absolutely have and so anytime you're working with especially young folks 
who may have gone through some adversity, a best practice is to connect with them, understand their journey, listen carefully and help them to see the things that they have figured out and that they have learned as life has taught you, taught them some things. So with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Adriana to go through some of the specific skills and then we'll come back with a couple other ones. Yep, so just as Carl had said, I'm gonna walk us through some of the specific skills and at least skill categories that we tend to touch on in performance psychology and how that can look applied in hopefully your world and your setting. And so this is for you as a support provider, um, but just as an individual, right? Because these are skills for life that we can always uh, integrate into our lifestyle to make sure that we're maintaining on a healthy path for ourselves as well as those around us. So that being said, we'll start with goal setting. Right. And so what we want to make sure we focus on with goal setting is that we're using maybe an outcome goal or a longer term goal or a big picture goal as emotional fuel. And everything we do, we want to make sure we're taking a strengths based and values approach. So this is where you can leverage your relationships and really how you know that person, how that person knows you and how not only you can leverage that to reach your own goals, but in terms of getting them to maintain motivation in reaching some of their bigger picture longer goals, um, because we know that if a goal is where we want to be, that's our outcome, then the values that we hold, those are like the, that's like the engine that drives us there, right? Our values drive every single thing that we do. And so if we can gain an understanding of how to leverage those values, we can be a lot better off in maintaining that motivation to get there, uh, especially since that's something that's internal to all of us. Now, we also want to make sure that with goal setting, if we're really looking forward to something that's a bit more long term, a bit more big picture, that we break down those big goals into actual achievable action steps, right? So making sure that we're hitting these short term goals, we're setting our path, we're getting on the right path, and then also that we're checking in and adjusting when necessary. A check in is really, really important in following a big goal because we need to see sometimes if we're still on the right path, if we need to make adjustments. It doesn't mean that you're not doing things right. It just means maybe there's a better way we can be doing this, or maybe we've learned something new and making an adjustment would be a smarter decision to follow through with. Um, but really embracing that idea that checking in and adjusting when necessary is the right thing to do. Second part, we're gonna talk about building confidence. Right, so what we talk about when we're talking about confidence with our athletes is really a choice, something that we can take control of and what voices are we listening to, what messages are we feeding our system, and being really confident and really intentional with the choice and ownership that we take on where we want to go with this. So one of the main skills we talk about when we talk about building confidence is the ability to frame and reframe the situation that we're in. Right? How am I filtering this experience to what I'm holding on to in terms of what am I really authentically about? And so let's take a difficult situation. Can I reframe it in a light that's more productive for me? And I don't mean to say that as just optimism and head in the sky, clouds in the sky, everything's butterflies and rainbows, but we want to make sure that we're talking about optimism tied to reality. It's not always about finding that silver lining, but bringing us back down to baseline and being able to see the situation for what it is allows us more clearly to recognize what we can do with it. And that can help us build confidence in ourselves and in our teammates or those around us in that moment. It's also really tied to self-talk, right? What are the messages that I'm feeding myself and the people around me? And what am I telling myself about the people around me and about my own abilities that I'm then filtering and reframing in my own body. So it can be really confusing at times. We wanna make sure that we're keeping the main thing the main thing and filtering the important stuff for ourselves going forward. We also wanna make sure that with confidence, we have a built-in community, right? We have the people that we can go to to help build our confidence. And again, what do we want to buy into and being really intentional and in choosing what we buy into and who we buy into it from. Right? Who is in our close circle of community that can give us that confidence when sometimes our confidence is waning and that's okay because that's natural too, but being intentional with who we have in that community. The third part is energy management. And now we use our language very importantly and very, very specifically here that we say energy management and not stress management because stress can get a bad rap. And when we're talking about energy management, we want to 
really break it down to understanding what it is our mind body connection, what it is our physiological signs are showing in our body is just trying to communicate something about the moment that we're in, right? So how do we understand those physiological signs? Am I sensing, let's say activation is a term we use a lot. Am I sensing activation of my fight or flight system? And to me, I'm internalizing that as I'm nervous about what's about to happen. I'm not ready for about for what's about to happen. Or can I take those same messages, those same signals from my body and frame it in a way or shift it in a way of, oh, this is just my body getting ready to do something that's important. Or, oh, this is a situation where the outcome matters. So my body has a little extra energy in it. This is how that shows up. And that's normal, right? A lot of times, just the power of normalizing something can take away some of its power over us and recognizing, okay, this is really more of a controllable. My mindset about these things is controllable. I understand what's happening. I can move forward confidently. As you'll see too, a lot of these skills are related to each other. So there's gonna be a lot of similar language. Um, but back to energy management. We can also use our breath work to manage our systems. So two of our main systems, our sympathetic nervous system and our parasympathetic nervous system often work like a seesaw. So if one is really activated, that means the other is really low and vice versa. We can use our breath, breath control to stabilize both systems and bring us back down to almost a baseline and increase some of our coherence and get back into a more rational state of mind just by using our breath, right? So having an understanding of how we can use something as simple as breathing, what we use every day, all the time anyway, but in a more proactive way as a skill, taking a long, slow, deep breath through our stomach, being able to slow down our system can be really helpful in maintaining some of our energy over longer periods of time or in a time of high energy activation. We'll stick with that. Um, there's also a really interesting study that we used to talk about often um, with when I used to work with soldiers down at Fort Bragg. It's a really interesting study done with a high stress, non-controlled group caretakers and then the control group of a low stress provider. And what they had done in that study was they provided a small wound on each person, no less than, or no bigger than one centimeter each. And they studied how that wound healed with both groups. So with the low stress group, that heal wound, or that wound healed pretty regularly and on a stable timeline. With the high stress group, that wound actually got worse and looked a bit worse before entering that healing phase. And it showed that the prolonged stress our body was under actually prolonged the healing process as well. So we know that energy management is really important in going forward and how we maintain our stress levels. Do we have appropriate outlets to seek? Do we have that community where we can engage and talk to you about some of our stressors? And do we have the appropriate and timely ways that we can recharge when necessary? Are we utilizing sleep, nutrition, hydration, things along those manners that help us, we know, recharge? Um, and whether that's in small bits and taking it when we can with our hectic schedules or making time and being proactive and scheduling out longer breaks for when we need them. Now, as we go into imagery, I'm gonna talk about leveraging how our brain works to build skills or that recovery piece again. We know our brain works in images. When we talk, we picture things. That's just how our brain works. So we can use it to develop skills or to build on skills that we already have, right? A lot of times when we're working with athletes in particular, we create imagery scripts so that they can feel more confident in their processes, whether that's a pregame imagery script or even an imagery script for specifically healing and recovering from an injury. Because we know that again, since our body and brain are connected, we can leverage that connection to get the most out of ourselves and maybe we don't have the most resources, we at least have ourselves. So uh, there's actually another interesting study that I wanted to bring up that was done on skiers that really shows the strength of the mind-body connection. And so what they did was they took probes and they put a little headset on and they had skiers imagine to the strength of their ability. And when we talk about imagery and visualization, it's not just our, um, our eyesight, right? We're not just talking about things we see. We can talk about 
layering in things that you might feel in an environment, things you might smell in an environment, things you might hear in an environment, right? Leveraging all our senses to get as strong as an imagery experience as possible. And so that's what they did in this study. And they leveraged, like I said, they leveraged downhill skiers. And what they did was they measured or they um, tried to measure their brain activity and the pathways that the neurological responses that happened when they said, okay, imagine yourself going down a hill that was pretty regular to them where they would know their cuts and their turns and things like that. They put probes on their body as well. And what they found was that the probes activated the muscles in their legs and their quads and their core activated just like it did actually going down the mountain. So there's a direct correlation that we see that if we use imagery very intentionally, really appropriately with again, integrating all of our senses, we're activating the very same skills as if we could physically do that task. Now we can't always physically do the tasks. We don't always have those, again, those resources, that time, but knowing that we can leverage our brain, and again, things we're always gonna have with us can be really powerful in what we do going forward with it. And last but not least, we've got our attention control. So we know that there's plenty of different models and outlooks on attention, but when we're talking about attention control, what we really wanna focus on is, is our attention on the right thing at the right time? And when it's not, let's say maybe it's um, on the wrong thing, but at the right time, do we know and do we have the skills to appropriate sh appropriately shift over to where it needs to be? Um, this can be really helpful in developing cues, again, self-talk and routines. So when we're talking about cues, we break our cues down into two different groups, and that's our action cues and our B cues. So our action cues are telling us or in pre-planning, okay, what do I need to do in this moment? What is the actual action I need to take to be productive and to get myself back to where I need to be? And a B cue is more of how do I want to be in this moment, right? What is the attitude I want to encompass? What is the mindset I want to take control of? What is that characteristic that I really need to be right now to be productive and be helpful for this moment. And that's how we can leverage self-talk ahead of time, knowing what we're getting ourselves into in our environments. Now, routines are also a really big part of our attention control, goal setting, building confidence, all of the above really. Um, but I wanna highlight them here under the attention control skills because routines help us transition from one moment into a next. And they can provide us some sense of relief, some sense of comfort because it takes out the guesswork. When we have a really disciplined routine, we already know what comes next. So our brain doesn't need to spend a lot of energy thinking about what that might be. Oh, what do I need to do now? What's next? What's going to happen with a specific routine? We already know. We have those things planned out. So there is no need for second guessing or for extra mental energy to be spent elsewhere. That was a long time of me talking. <laughs> I will kick it back over to Paul. Uh, thank you. So as Adriana mentioned, all of these skills that you see listed here <clears throat> are practicable skills that have uh, sub skills underneath them and can be applied to any part of life. Now we're going to take a couple of minutes and talk about some constructs that can be really useful when we're looking at the challenges and adversity of life. And the first one is psychological hardiness. So this is a term that uh, was coined in the 1970s, a guy named uh, Dr. Salvador Mahdi did a lot of research on people that were under unrelenting stress and succumbed to the stress and other people that were under unrelenting stress and managed to not only uh, persevere, but in some cases thrive. And so he broke down hardiness into four subcomponents, challenge, control, commitment, and courage. And we'll hit each of those separately. So the challenge piece of it, again, all of these are choices that you're making, choosing to look at situations in a certain way. So challenge is looking at the situation as an opportunity to accomplish something versus an obstacle. Finding the challenge in any uh, adversity is it's a part of a language set of, okay, there's a way through this. I just got to figure it out. Control comes back to controlling the controllables. See, there are a lot of things that are outside our control. We talked about that earlier being able to dominate the controllables, first you gotta find them and figure out what is it. Sometimes it's as simple as the way that you breathe. 
or the language that you use or what you focus on and all of the things that Adriana just walked us through. The third C is commitment. That's about, are you invested in a cause that's greater than yourself? Like, are you completely sold out to something that's that you're passionate about, your purpose, or some people say your why? Right? When you have found that level of commitment where everything that you're doing matters and you're passionate about it, it is much easier to continue to take steps forward. And it was uh, probably about 15 years ago or so, I got a chance to talk with Dr. Maddie and I had done some research on his constructs as well. And I asked him, what's new in your world? And he said, well, I added a fourth C and it's courage. And courage is not the absence of fear. It's the recognition that something else is even more important. And that's a loosely uh, quoted uh, phrase that a lot of different people have been associated with. But it's this idea that we have the strength of character to actually engage in the challenge control and commitment on a consistent basis. So it's one thing to view things a certain way. It's another to, to be able to mobilize yourself to do that. And that's in the face of any adversity. So the next uh, construct that we'll talk about is adaptation. So here's some things that we know. If, you're, if you want your muscles to get stronger, you got to work them hard. And then they, in the recovery process, they grow. If you want your brain to become smarter, you got to challenge it. And in the recovery process and the sleep and restorative rest, your brain gets smarter over time. It's the same with lung capacity. It's the same with everything. So when we look at the tough situations that we're in, it doesn't mean that we're going to enjoy the discomfort. It means that we recognize that it's an important component of the adaptation process. You think about immune systems. You, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, people succumbed to certain things. Over time, we adapted as a, as a species, and now we have stronger immune systems in different ways, and it's obviously helped by modern medicine and so forth. But it, this whole adaptation process that makes you more prepared for the next thing that you're going to encounter. This is also a component of growth, as I mentioned, the things that grow and get stronger. Growth here is recognizing that as you go through something, you're going to become a better version of yourself. If you choose to engage in the skills Adriana mentioned, and you choose to make those you know, mindset choices that we're talking about in the hardiness piece. It also has to do with the growth mindset and recognizing that nobody is done learning and nobody is done getting better until they decide they're done. Right? So everything that you experience in life, there's an opportunity in there to grow in some way. And then closely related is resilience. Resilience is an interesting term because uh, one, it has its own competencies underneath it. And two, it's got about 27 different definitions out there. When we were doing some research in the army and coming up with some aspects of resilience programs, it was stunning to see how many different ways there were to describe it. So I'm gonna simplify it here, overly simplify it just to make it practical for us right now. It is, uh, First and foremost, being able to bounce back from adversity. And so if you think about a tennis ball and you squeeze the tennis ball and then it, it returns to its shape. So it's, it's back to normal. Right? It's also the ability to bounce forward and actually grow through the adversity that you hit. So that would be for those familiar with the old super balls where you could throw it and it bounced. And then the second bounce was even higher than the first bounce. Right? It's that ability to not only... Um, bounce back, but bounce forward and continue to grow. Some of the skills that Adriana uh, mentioned already are, have been demonstrated in different research studies that, that actually facilitate resilience and contribute to it. Things about the self-awareness and self-regulation aspects of optimism, which isn't sunshine and roses. It's, you know, if the glass is half full or the glass is half empty, nope, it's what can I do with what's in my glass? like in finding a purposeful way to move forward again. Um, the mental agility, which is tied to uh, attention control and the ability to shift your attention to the next most important thing instead of getting caught up on stuff that's already happened that you can't control. Um, the strength of character that I mentioned earlier and connection, like human beings are wired for connection. Um, we're, we're better 
for ourselves or better for others if we have these authentic connections realize that we're, we are tied to something much bigger than ourselves and we can gain some energy and perspective from that as well and then uh, we have the opportunity to work with another one of our colleagues who's done a lot of research in the space of thriving. So Nicole DeFerrari is one of our colleagues and partners here at Penn State, and uh, she's got really cool ways of describing thriving, and I'm not going to try to replicate her because I can't, but I'll share that thriving sometimes is misperceived as just being positive. Like I got to be 100% positive 100% of the time, and that's not it at all. What we're talking about with uh, thriving is this idea of being able to live with purpose and balance. So you're investing your energy in the stuff that's really important to you. And you're achieving balance across your life in, in not in terms of equal amounts of time doing different things, but you're expending your energy on the stuff that's really meaningful. And you're using some of the skills that Adriana mentioned earlier to regain energy and regain balance in your life so that you're it's more of a values balance than a specific time on a clock. It also means that as you're hitting different uh, moments of adversity or challenge, that you do it head on. You don't swerve, you don't hide, you don't cower. You look at the adversity and say, okay, this is gonna be interesting. And then you move forward through it, right? And then the last thing that I'll mention about this, I used the term er earlier, um, agility, being agile and adaptive, or as Nicole says, flexibly approaching life, recognizing that you don't want to get stuck in, okay, this is the plan, and now the plan didn't happen, so now my world's falling apart. It's, oh, plan A didn't happen. There's 25 more letters in the alphabet. They all have equal value. They just look different. It's okay. Now we're just going to shift. The A phrase that's used oftentimes uh, in this shift is, what's important now, you know, the acronym W-I-N, easy to remember, what's important now, something's most important, and then you get new information, something else now is most important, and so you intentionally shift. So if you can combine this idea of intentionally shifting and knowing how you recharge your batteries with the energy management techniques that Adriana mentioned earlier, whether it's breathing, gratitude, your own reset process, if you can do both of those things, then you can flexibly approach life with purpose and balance. And so with that, what I'd like to do is um, open up for some questions, hopefully from you all, because that's the most exciting part of any presentation is, is figuring out what the audience is interested in and hitting those. So Philip's, Philip has agreed to moderate the Q&A period. And the only thing that I ask is if there's a specific person you would like to answer a question, please let us know. If you want multiple perspectives on a, on a topic, please let us know. Or if you just want to have a conversation, we can do that too. So thank you. And just as a reminder, you can uh, put your questions in the Q&A using the Q&A button. Or if you want to, you can just use the raise hand icon and then uh, I'll give you some per, uh, permissions to speak. And so you can just ask your questions openly. Um, so while you're thinking of some of the questions that you want to ask, I just want to say um, I love the, the win concept, what's important now, um, and intentionally shifting. Um, of course, I also have that military background, so I understand that uh, what's the phrase we always say, uh, you got to fight the battle, not the plan, meaning that things change as you know conditions shift, as things don't go the way that you think they were going to go. Um, you have to adjust. And so having a good plan, but then also being flexible in order to move. What would you say is, and this is for either one of you, what would you say for someone who is just starting to try to use some of these concepts with, with, with young people, what would be the first place that you would start as far as trying to um, begin that growth process with them? Wow, that's a great question. Um, so I'll start with listening carefully. I think when you listen to somebody's journey, their story, 
it's going to tell you a lot. And if you're listening out of curiosity and listening to understand versus jump to an answer, uh, they're going to share a ton that's going to give you insight. And being patient and persistent, those are two words that come in handy as well. Be patient with the listening and not jump to, ooh, it sounds like an opportunity to introduce attention control or something. It's build the relationship through that curiosity and that listening, and then allow like these different skills that we've talked about and constructs and so forth. You don't want to have them feel like they're going to school learning these things. These are things that you use in ways to connect with them to something like you can have a little bit better day in the next 30 minutes by thinking about, you know, uh, the way you breathe before you respond or something like that. But I really do believe uh, in, from my perspective, a lot of this starts with listen very carefully and listen to understand. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Listening to understand, listening completely, um, because they'll tell you where they want to go with it, obviously, in their own ways. Um, and so leveraging that relationship that you're either trying to build with them or have built with them. And then kind of going back to that strengths-based approach piece, recognizing that it's always easier to look at what we don't have. That's the easiest part, right? Like, oh, what don't we have? What are we missing? There's always going to be things like that. We're never going to have it all and we're never going to have enough. But if we keep the mindset and the focus back on what we do have, what can we do in that situation and keep the focus more on that, we'll find out we probably do have more than we think or we have strengths that we didn't know that we had that we can leverage going forward. Appreciate that. Um, we have a question that came in and it says, when it comes to athletes becoming or trying to become elite, do you think that selfishness, not in a bad way, just focusing on the purpose can lead to negative effects on their mental space? Wow, that one could take a while. Um, so the selfish in that they're working on themselves and wanting to put a lot of energy on themselves and their, their growth and being selective with their time and what they apply it to, that would that could be a really good thing. Selfish, where it's putting the self in front of the team or above the team can get in the way. It, we're assuming it's a team sport. Uh, and it, it can definitely get in the way and have some negative effects to that. Um, let me pause there for a second, see if Adriana has any thoughts. I had a thought that came in and left and I'm gonna see if it comes back. <laughs> yeah, my initial thought too, because it's a fantastic question, um, is recognizing that a lot of times in team sports, at least, and even if it's, let's say, like a tennis where you might perform in an individual moment or a gymnastics where you're, you're performing individually, but it's part of a larger team, I think what we, we fail to recognize sometimes in aspects like that is that if we progress, if, our, if we become elite, then we could do that in a way that also encourages those around us to become elite also, right? And so same thing with the team. If those around us are great, then we can also get lifted up that way. Um, whereas I do think there is a difference, and I don't know if that's what you're getting at with this question about being obsessed. Being obsessed is never a healthy take on the pursuit for anything, right? But if we have these respectful and understanding these boundaries and becoming elite and knowing that the path is not a straight line upwards, but we're gonna have up days, we're gonna have down days, as long as we're progressing in the right direction, we're on the right path. But anytime we start seeing obsessive tendencies, that can lead to negative effects, making sure that again, we're doing this for the right reasons, for the right purpose and, and balancing all that comes with being elite. Yeah, and I'll link back also to what Adriana was talking about earlier with the goal setting piece of, you know, if you're, you're wanting to become elite and that gives you emotional fuel to dominate the basics of your craft, whatever it is, that can work really well for you. And so what one of the ways that we sometimes describe this is that human beings aren't necessarily elite, but their attitudes, beliefs and behaviors are elite. You know, those are controllable, practicable things. The, the way you look at a situation, 
the beliefs that you have and your ability to accomplish things individually and collectively, and then actually doing the work consistently, that's going to move you in a really good direction. You may, may or may not ever get labeled elite, but you're going to be in a great place compared to where you were. Um, by obsessing, and which is a great word, on, on being elite, it, there's, a, there's a lot of unintended consequences that come from that obsession. We have another question. Um, earlier, you spoke about um, providing structure and consistency to help allow the brain to not expend extra energy. How, what are some, some ways that we can uh, provide that consistency during the COVID-19 pandemic? So that, that actually came up a lot, especially during the first year of the pandemic with our teams. And so I'll just kind of get us roll and we can share some of the different conversations that we've had. You know, you, when you're, one of the things that COVID did is it um, presented a, a situation where a lot of stuff was outside of our control. A lot of stuff was initially ambiguous. And then there was sudden change, policy change, conditions change and so forth. <laughs> That's a lot. So finding structure in your day um, gives you some sense of normalcy, regardless of whether you're quarantine, isolation, sick yourself, whatever. So literally, literally sitting down and writing out a structure for the day. And if you if the day seems too intimidating, a structure for the morning, a structure for the next hour. And as part of the, when we say structure, a, a sense of familiarity that I've got these things that are important to me, so I'm giving them space in my day. And one of those things is spending time reflecting on gratitude and appreciation. Nobody's grateful for a pandemic, but we have plenty of people that have said they found opportunities in there to read a book, to connect with somebody that they hadn't been connected with, um, to do some reflection, some journaling and so forth. So there's plenty of hidden opportunities in adversity building them into the structure without having feeling like you are over programmed, right? Cause you want to make sure that you have some downtime in your structure as well. So you can just kind of be and live. Um, and then we, as we're doing now with technology, we learned a lot about how to leverage technology. We don't want to be wedded to it. 24 seven technology is not healthy, but we can now connect in ways like we have people that can, we're connected with a, a, like a think tank of sorts of people that are around the world now. And we have these different conversations that are fascinating. You know, we have a coach that's, that always wanted to do a sabbatical and never could. So during COVID, he did. He, he created a virtual sabbatical experience and brought other coaches in for conversations. So the structure can mean different things, but it gives you a sense of maybe familiarity, some positivity in there and some excitement. So I'll start us there. Yeah, not much to add there. Carl covered a lot of bases. Um, I think too, recognizing that sometimes open spaces can, to some people feel a bit freeing and to some people it can be a bit worrying of like, well, now I have a whole day, what am I gonna do? And one thing we talked about with some of our athletes was, okay, now just because you don't have morning lift at 6 a.m. doesn't mean you should stay up until you know 1 a.m. just because you can. Right, and in recognizing that our body responds and performs really well when we have that routine, when we have that rhythm. So even if it's just creating space for yourself, creating a plan for yourself of from this time to this time, this is what I do, or as simple as maybe having a large chunk of space, but at least knowing, okay, well, this is my nighttime routine. And that can bring me comfort then going into bed, signaling to my system, this is time for rest. Um, being creative and in recognizing again, like I said, just because maybe you can stay up late, like Carl said, it's not great for us to be connected to technology all the time. Just because we can stay up late watching TV or scrolling on our phones doesn't necessarily mean we should. We can still fall back on some things that we know are proven to be beneficial for us. So we have another question here um, and it says, 
you mentioned before about reframing and I liked how you talked about it wasn't just a bed of roses and just, you know, putting on rose colored goggles. Can you talk more about techniques to help uh, develop reframing um, activities or be getting or how to get better at reframing um, in, in trying times or stressful situations? So reframing can be a really helpful skill. Obviously, I'm glad you liked that phrasing. I'll make sure to keep that in my pocket. Um, and I think realistically, it starts with the intention, right? And the awareness and recognizing that just because we experiencing, we are experiencing something one way does not mean that that's the only way to experience that. And if we can bring that intentionality with us going forward, and that skill of really being able to take a step back to gain some perspective, that can be really helpful. So with that, I'd say even just start with self-reflection. What are certain experiences you've already had or that you've lived through that maybe weren't the greatest? Some maybe were the greatest, right? Start playing around with what you've already lived through and trying to take that perspective step back of, okay, how did this maybe get me where I wanted to be somehow, or how did this play a role in what came next for me and, and start playing around that way so that as we go forward, again, with that intention, we can recognize and, and more easily get comfortable with that idea of stepping back and trying to see, okay, maybe this is a setback. Okay, maybe this isn't great, but it's also not terrible or it's there, there's something that we can do here with the entirety of the situation as opposed for only seeing it one way. And um, a technique that uh, I've seen pretty helpful in some situations, along with the reflection pieces, literally capturing on a piece of paper, writing down thoughts that have come that um, you might want to try to reframe. And w one of the things that we talk about sometimes is the idea that facts and feelings are two different things. And when you have objective facts, you may not be able to reframe the fact you might be able to look at it from different perspectives or different lenses. Feelings um, are very important. I think it's very special as human beings that we have all these feelings. But again, we want to capture them and then say, OK, is there another way to be looking at this situation? Or if, if a friend of yours had this thought, could you help that person reframe something? Well, have you thought about, or what else could be the reason, or it, what is another way of looking at the situation? And sometimes we can't automatically jump from reframing negative to positive. Sometimes we can get ourselves to a neutral spot and take a, a, a negative perspective and say, okay, can we take the sting out of this and say, okay, I accept the fact that this thing happened. Okay, we just got to neutral. From neutral, we can say, okay, now, is there a way to look at this as a hidden opportunity to move forward? That would be jumping to the more positive. It can be, it can feel almost disingenuous to jump from negative to positive sometimes, but moving into that neutral space to give yourself a pause and a chance to take a deep breath may help you gain the perspective needed to get to that positive frame. So again, continue to put your questions in. We'll continue to answer them. Now uh, we probably have time for a few more. Um, as we're waiting for more questions to come in, one thing that I would ask is when we think about performance psychology, and like you said, it's specifically labeled performance and not sports psychology, but I think a lot of people still think of it as, well, this is just for athletes. Can you talk a little bit about how how you use this in everyday life or how you use this with um, people outside of the athletic department or outside world? Yeah, sure. So, because we, we both have been in that space where we're taking these skills into different directions. My first foray into that was back in 1996 when I got to the Center for Enhanced Performance the first time. And we were looking at military athletic and academic applications of these skills and then many years later it's you know gotten much much bigger and we're it's in dance but it's also in the operating room and the boardroom and 
you know, always on the athletic fields as well. But again, it's you're in these situations where um, you're involved in something important. There's some other force working against you. There's some aspects that are outside of your control. And you just want to keep coming back to like, am I aware of myself, my tendencies, my strengths? Can I leverage them in here in this self-regulation space? So I'll use a leadership example for a moment. If we, if a, a military leader, so I'll go there since we both work in that space, you take a battalion commander or a brigade commander, if that individual who owns the schedule, who owns the resources and so forth, is using language of coaching the solution, is composed and may be a fiery personality, may be stoic personality, but is under self-control at all times, that leader is going to be able to convey more information than somebody that is uh, kind of losing it, right? And it's in, they're not clear in their communication in those cases, and the stress that they're putting on themselves becomes contagious, and so things don't go so well. So if you can model in, front, in a leadership uh, position the ability to keep a cool head, to stay under control, to be coaching the solution instead of pointing out problems, it can be really helpful. The mental agility piece of it that we both talked about in different ways, the idea that, and you mentioned Philip, but you know, uh, one of the things that um, President Eisenhower, General Eisenhower at the time talked about is that plans are largely useless, but the planning process is essential because you're thinking about it in so many different ways that gives you a baseline to adjust off of. And then when you have to adjust, the mental agility to the next most important thing, it's not a panicked shift. It's a very much self-controlled shift. So, you know, again, coming back to internalize these skills because you want to manage you to your very best, it doesn't matter what activity you're involved in, it's gonna have a, a positive effect. Yeah, I think one thing, just going a bit more bigger picture, right, to everything that Carl said was spot on is the idea that we can all benefit greatly always from re-engaging in self-awareness and increasing our self-awareness and self-regulation skills. Um, we all have blind spots. That's We don't know them. That's the thing, right? And so a lot of times that's another reason why that community aspect and having people close to us is so important because they sometimes see things that we can't. And maybe we're getting in our own way. And when you have a trusted friend or confident confidant, be able to say like, hey, did you know, you know, your back tail lights out? You know, we're, we're not the ones recognizing that. It's the people behind us or the people around us that will. And so recognizing, okay, like that's, that's a growth in self-awareness, right? Maybe there's something I can do there now. And, and recognizing that, again, it's not always the sport application, but it's just a life application of where am I headed? Where am I going? And is this the best way to be doing that? And taking a deep reflection back on what's driving me here? What are my motivations, my values? And how can I gain greater happiness by leveraging those values in my everyday life? Because we know we're happier when we live a values-based life versus something else driving us, right? Or if we're living a life that goes against maybe our values, we recognize that there's some internal conflict there. And so again, leveraging what drives us to make sure we're fulfilled and satisfied in what goes forward. So we'll pause here for a moment to see if there's any final questions out there. Again, you can uh, put them in the Q&A or you can hit the, your raised hand icon and I'll give you some speaking permission so you can ask directly. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen too. Well, if there are no more questions, then um, we would just like to say thank you again for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate your your discussion and your talk. And again, it's I thought it was very informative and we really appreciate the way that you brought it to us. Um, just to close us out for 
as a reminder to all of our um, CIFAR grantees, don't forget our professional development event will be in person this year. It's gonna be from June 1st and 2nd, 2022 in Chicago. And uh, again, we're asking everyone if you have promos, uh, uh, proposals that you wanna submit, please have those in by February the 10th. Um, again, one last time, we'd just like to thank our, our folks from the Penn State uh, Performance Psychology. Um, we really appreciate it. And this webinar will be lo uh, loaded onto our sci-fi.org website here in a few days. And if you, there's any other questions or anything else, uh, please feel free to reach out to us at sci-fi.pdta at umn.edu. Again, thank you, Carl and Adriana, and we appreciate it. And thank you all for uh, participating and joining us today.